are Squawking Dead, a podcast pulverizing programs beyond the Walking Dead universe. Sometimes we give you news, sometimes we make you laugh, but most times we go deep. I'm your host, David Cameo, and I'm joined by Bridget, ko-fi.com slash punky brewster. That's P-O-N-K-Y-B-R-U-I-S-E-T-E-R. And we're here to recap the first season of Silo. It's a series I've been wanting to cover for the longest time, and we only decided to cover it now for some reason because the second season will be coming out on november 17th of this year so in a couple months mm-hmm. so we're getting that out of the way now so that we could focus on the series from on mgm which is coming out in a few weeks we're going to be recapping the first two seasons before season three comes out on the 22nd of september 9 p.m eastern on mgm plus in case you missed it we had a lot of action on our kofi and patreon pages Namely, we had to change the pricing on our membership tiers and add a new one, our producer tier called the Great M tier, which is Glenn, <laughs> Rosita, Glenn, Rosita, Eugene, Eugene Abraham, Abraham, Tara, Maggie. Tara, Maggie. I got I it. I said it first. <laughs> he's going to edit the sound so that it sounds like he's saying it first, even though it's clearly me on screen. Yeah, actually, I'll replace what you're saying with. <laughs> hey, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay touche. what are you saying bridget anyway <laughs> touche that's pretty great yeah <laughs> can't fault you for that one now why is it called the great m tier because it's not quite the daryl rick carol and michonne tier that's us we're hosts where we get the greatest we're the best <laughs> but you're the producer <laughs> but effectively you're on the same level of, of us because on top of having the survivor tier level perks you'll have the ability to join our core channel which is our own personal hosts channel where you can be a part of those discussions, discussions we're not even prepared to have with our audience. Not really, no. Yeah, but also be able to join in on our budget discussions, scheduling, con schedule, discussing what we could and should do, be a part of brainstorming ideas. This is where half the magic happens in the core role on our Discord server among those channels. So consider that as an option now it is a very high priced perk it's not for everybody but it might be for some people who are interested in seeing the growth of this podcast explode you will be credited the same way as survivors tier members you'll have all the same really 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 cool perks you'll basically have access to all the downloadable content all the stuff that we put in our coffee shop it's like you're a host but you don't have to be on camera if you don't like it yeah basically there you yeah go. which most at this point survivors tier members they say they don't like it yeah but they want to support the podcast and they want to fund something great see if you're interested in that as well as all our other membership tiers which had to change pricing but also some in feature as well we made the verbiage on the walkers whispers survivors tiers a lot more clear for instance in the whispers tier, we make it clear that there is a newscaster perk which means that you along with Survivor Seer members, can join us in our breaking news live streams. So so that's a lot more clear. The ability to join us in any special projects that we will be announcing in respective channels on our Discord. We make those instructions a lot more clear and readily available so that you can join our Discord channel where a lot of the magic happens. Sharon would say the best channel is the memes channel. They'll let us know about that. In any case, let's talk about Silo Season 1. Let's just start with a little background information on sure. Silo, shall we? First off, these are based on novels that came out. The series began in 2011. There were three of them. It's a trilogy. It's written by Hugh Howey. And by Howey, it's H-O-W-E-Y. They are dystopian, post-apocalyptic stories. They are not called Silo at all. So don't go looking for the novel Silo. You're not going to find it. Wool, <laughs> Shift, and Dust. That's the order. So wool is first, shift is two, and three is dust. You can buy them in a silo set because, you know, marketing. I haven't listened to it yet because I am currently listening to a different series of books. And not every day is like an audiobook kind of day. Some days you ride home in silence because you're like, my brain is broken. Because your brain and is screaming. I can't do this anymore. Right. And you can't hear the podcast over your own brain screams. Yes. So sometimes <laughs> I do that. Sometimes it's just music and really loudly. Sometimes it's actual screaming. Sometimes it's actually just me screaming. <laughs> Why am I making fun of you? It's terrible. 
So when was the series released? I think it was 2022. Honestly, the only reason I watched it is because you had watched it. I said it was great. And I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, Dave. Because that's always what I do to Dave when right. he tells me Dave likes things. everything. So why would I watch it? I'm like, why listen to Dave? Even though Dave has only recommended absolute bangers to me, honestly. Like everything <laughs> Dave true. has told me to watch is really good. Takira told me to watch it because she got really sucked into oh, so it. Takira says it and then you finally do it. Finally, then Fine. I listened. And so okay. I started to watch it. And if I'm not mistaken, we all started watching Foundation right after too which is I, also I on apple tv way earlier but yeah. it's also a future sci-fi tv show dystopian almost yeah not as good i couldn't get into it even though we visually Lee paces the incredible star. it's amazing but they're both vi- visually it. incredible but foundation is on a whole other level foundation is more like dune to me speaking of dune but based on asimov so speaking on dune let's talk about the lead character in this television show rebecca ferguson who is a Bene Gesserit. <laughs> so I haven't watched Dune. You haven't watched Dune? Rebecca Ferguson is the mother of... Make that make sense for me. <laughs> ...of the main character. I can't remember the main character's name. I'm just saying the actress is in Dune, which is kind of interesting. Oh. She's really like okay. niched herself into... I thought you were describing a character. No, no, no. Okay, no. Okay, she okay. literally plays a Bene Gesserit, G- Bene okay. Gesserit which is... Does she actually anyways, use her I'm Swedish doing. accent more? She talks the same... I would argue in both. I think that is just the way she talks. And I will say she's got a great voice. Yeah, I, I, love I agree. It, I it love was it. a little distracting at first, but having her well, father, because you're like, Nichols, you're like, why do all these people have accents, even though they've all been living in a silo for like 200 plus years? Well, that, that did occur like to a me. Little but, bit then, weird. <laughs> but then you hear Pete Nichols, who is played by, I think it's Ian Glenn, who was it also in Game of it Thrones. Yes. Who played Jorah Mar- Mormont. So he's English and he can muddle his American accent to sound like her accent. So it kind of made sense to me because he does sound a little strange. It is distracting a little bit at the beginning because there's like a lilt to it that you're like, what is that? And I couldn't pinpoint it. Swedish. So that's where that came from. Something about it is just nice to listen to. Just the accent. I'd like her to just (laughs) read things to me. I feel like. Oh, well, yeah. Listen. Give up your career, Rebecca Ferguson. Go into voice acting just for Bridget. Audiobooks, just do she audiobooks will pay for you. me. She'll pay you good money. I, I have She'll zero pay money. She'll pay you no money. I, there we go. That's more accurate. <laughs> You'd be making Bridget's Drives Home less screamy, both in the brain and in maybe. the voice. Yeah, maybe. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that casting for this show was pretty impeccable and hope you didn't love anyone because... Good God, they drop like flies. You know what? Yeah. One right after the other, especially those first couple episodes. It's like, holy crap. What right, is right. That, you make a great point. The most endearing of the characters end up dying, basically. Holston, Allison, the people that you sympathize, the curious people, the people who want to know more, who want to know the truth at first. And then, of course, the people who just want to live their lives for the rest of their lives yeah. in peace, like Marnes and Johns, Samuel Marnes, who's played by, by the way, We've never said this on the podcast before, but Will Patton, I'm watching him right now on Amazon Prime's Outer Range, and he is bananas. He's a bananas character. And so him committing to that bananas character is just so fascinating to watch. And he's always done this. So when you see him in this role, he's still got a little bananas in him. Every now and again, it comes out. He's kind of like goofy almost. But not funny, haha, goofy. No, like a dry sense of humor about him i don't know something about him is really interesting he's very physical with his facial features and emotions his voice does that thing where which is always adorable he goes he's kind of like uh when <laughs> the ghoul, he's gravelly it's it's gravelly and has his dish mm-hmm. when he goes like this his voice is like this i'm voices like this yeah Barnes. <laughs> the casting is a 10 out of 10 i would say there's not anybody in this That I didn't just absolutely adore. And even if I didn't know them prior to this, I know them now. It's stuck with me. Well, yeah. Let's let's take one out of a hat, though. You've got Tim Robbins, who plays his role. (laughs) Yes. Just wow. Tim Robbins-esque. Oh, I don't know that I've ever hated Tim Robbins as much as I've hated him in this. That's just such a testament to how great of an actor he is. There's such a humor in almost all of his roles for some reason. I don't know if it's typecasting. I don't know if it's, it's the like way a levity he acts. that he brings, I think, to it. Yeah, I, I would say le- levity is probably the more accurate term, but I find myself sometimes laughing 
to either to myself or out loud at certain lines. I was going through a Reddit thread about this last episode, about the 10th episode, because I just watched the 9th and 10th today. Oh, cutting it close. And well, you know how it is, Dave. <laughs> time. There's not enough time. Yes, I watched it yesterday. <laughs> yes, I couldn't. I couldn't. It got to the, all of the deaths over and over again. And I was just like, dude, this is so heavy. And then those middle episodes are really hard to watch because it's not as much forward movement it's more story building and right it's like back you know, relationships and stuff so it's hard to watch so i had to like shut it off and like let my brain rest for a while anyway i've gone back to watch this a couple times already since my initial watch through of it which was not long after you watched it and then talked to me about it and then takira watched it then you watched so, it again it sounds like I, yeah i've watched it and not all the way through but yeah i've watched it i've started it a couple of times let's focus on this one piece though because well actually maybe these two pieces because it kind of makes sense together one is the many deaths and two mm-hmm. is the sort of backtracking so let's take our head spaces back to when we first watched the series yes because when you first watch the series something sounds familiar in these episodes and that is Not a lot of the people we start falling in love with make it Mm -hmm. past even the first episode. And so that reminds me a lot of the original Walking Dead, where by the end of the season, you have a ton of people that maybe you didn't care about as much, but definitely one person, not the end of the first season, is it? No, it's the second season. So you've got Shane who ends up getting killed. Yeah, end of first season is Jim. It was supposed to be the first season, but end of first season, Jim dies. Yes. Well, because they blew the storytelling way out of the water in terms of world building versus the comic book shane dies on like the second issue or something it's like super fast going back and reading it now i'm like dude you thought the walking dead was bad (laughs) how how did you do this with so little source material jim dies amy dies and those are jackie die in the first season too jackie chooses to die yes right at the cdc correct for most people most of those characters didn't really mean too much to you but it meant they meant a lot to the characters it affected mm-hmm. in some ways but in this series it's familiar in that you sort of do care about them they're starting to do things they're starting to come around on other things in some mm-hmm. ways and then they're gone that affects you and even later on in the series important characters that you grew to love they start disappearing too mm-hmm. and it gives you that same vibe all in the first season so let's stay here bring yourself back to the first your first watch and did you notice that did that impress you in a way i remember when i was watching it the first time i work early most days i have to be up by like 6 a.m at the very latest so that i can get ready in time for work to leave on time so staying up to watch a tv show is not usually in my wheelhouse (laughs) it's not for me I do a lot of like just vacant scrolling on my phone instead (laughs) or, you know, shout out to TikTok, (laughs) turn it off my brain (laughs) or I'll turn on like a sleep story before I go to bed and listen to that or something to kind of try to slow my mind. Every once in a while, the Walking Dead channel will come on and I will fall asleep to the sweet, soothing sounds of the undead. The worst white noise machine ever. Yeah. For me to like stay up for a TV show is a pretty big deal. And this show hooked me in a way that I hadn't been hooked in a while. And I've often vocalized this on the podcast. I've talked about how there's not many shows that really make me want to sit down and watch it. Now, Silo, I will say the mystery was great. It hooked me. It was great. But once you like get to the end of the season, it doesn't have the rewatchability of The Walking Dead or from for me. I don't see that as a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. I don't think that is like a detriment because it's a show that I'm still excited to tell other people about. And when they get excited about what's happening, I get excited like I'm going through it for the first time. It's like, oh, we're doing this together. (laughs) Yeah. But I remember staying up late and being like, "Uh, one more episode because I was just dying to figure out what was going on. And I was left with so many questions that actually I remember, I, I think Trav may have been like in the living room or in the shower or something. I was in the bedroom watching this because he was not interested. I think he's hooked now, honestly. Oh, because of your rewatch? Yeah, he's like, when does this come? Did it get canceled? And I'm like, no, it didn't. He's like, when oh. is it going to be on again? So I think he's, <laughs> so he's, he's I playing think it he off. He's like, yeah, all right. I remember sitting up in bed at the last episode and being like, what? 
what <laughs> just like baffled by what had happened and what was going on and just being like what what and how but do what, you leave how? how do you leave on this note what am i supposed to do with this information what's behind the door man what's behind the door what's in the box i like couldn't handle it right and then you're left there for however long it's going to be until that second season comes out and then the writer strike came which we talked yes. about at the season finale discussion of house of the dragon second season same feelings, but even less visibility because it's not House of the Dragon. It's a new series. Yeah. That there. How do you what do you when is it? How is it going to come out? <laughs> yeah. Is it even going to last? Because I remember us or talking is it about even going to come back. That was, was the question too. you, me and Takira had talked about that on like one of the channels, I believe, as we did have a silo thread for a minute there where we were talking about like, is it going to come back because of the writer's strike? Did other people find it and love it enough for this to be continued? Yeah. Because it's Apple TV. Apple TV can take more Apple risks, TV I isn't think. like huge, right? It's not huge, huge. They have Ted Lasso, and I think that did a lot for them. They've had a lot of other shows on Apple TV, but not many people talk about them. They're not like widely successful. They've had only grade A talent. So I'm like always shocked. By yeah, most how, of their IP is A list actors. Yes. Like, yeah. I Avalon, remember when Gloria, it first started, yeah. <laughs> there was like a show with Jason Momoa on it, I believe. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but I know what you're talking about. Their star studded showcase yes. involved two particular series. One was The Morning Show, Steve Carell. Oh, sure. Was that Reese Witherspoon? Yes. Jennifer Reese, Aniston? Reese, Jennifer Aniston. Yep. It distinguishes itself by carrying far less of a catalog than Netflix. Yes. So I kind of refer to it as this sort of boutique luxury hotel of streaming services where sure, honestly, in terms of ratio, they have far more hits in terms of, I don't know about Emmys or Oscars or anything like that, but they have so many award winning television shows and movies, yeah. or at least recognizable, distinguished compared to when they don't. Mm -hmm. Whereas Netflix was <laughs> used to be referred to as, oh, you want a movie? Talk to Netflix. They'll greenlight yeah. it. Or a TV show, they'll pitch it and then they'll yeah. take it to run. So they'll focus more on quality more than quantity. And I think that's maybe even their strong suit. That's probably true. Because Presumed Innocent, I think, has done fairly well. Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, it's a newer one. I started it, couldn't super get into it. But honestly, like, I don't have a lot of time to be watching shows I want to watch. Because I have to watch whatever shows we're covering. I wanted to go back to the whole rewatchability thing. Let me just tell you from my perspective, I think it doesn't need to be rewatched because... One of its strong suits is that we made a lot of comparisons recently in our Discord because we're covering all this stuff now of Silo to, let's say, From or even Lost, where in some respects, From and Lost has this mystery box thing where almost every detail might mean something more mm -hmm. as they come back to it or we refer to it or that's a detail that we'll need to know later on. That is well, it's vague. like more cerebral. I don't want to say cerebral, but more like you ever play a video game where you have an item in your inventory that doesn't mean anything for most yes. of the game until the very end yes. or things like that. It's the same yeah. thing with shows. Sometimes they have a detail that's there. Now, Silo has that too, but it does not waste time usually in most cases, A, making it a huge mystery. Mm -hmm. It has relevance in the moment even. Well, they did wrap up almost everything by the end of the first season and instead was like, Oh, we'll wrap up all of these really nicely and tie that in a bow. And then here's a brand new thing for you to be like, what? Because they introduce something right at the end that all of a sudden Juliet Nichols is leaving and her monitor switches to what's really in front of her. And there's a huge wide shot pan that like circles and like comes back around. And all you see is other silos. Right. With a ruined city possibly in the distance. And nowhere in, in my mind had that been part of this story you wondered about like where does the door go that george found and why doesn't bernard know about the door because he clearly doesn't tim robbins is like the right he gets that left tim robbins many, face exactly this made many me laugh. mysteries it, well that and when he yells shut your eyes <laughs> shut your eyes <laughs> yep in that way yeah yeah it's another funny. thing that made me laugh was when he was cornering or taking julia to the side to talk about the hard drive Mm -hmm. But he he says the word hard drive out loud. Is it because you have the hard drive? Wait, I shouldn't have said hard drive. And then he looks up a little bit. <laughs> and then Tim Robbins way that's like, 
oops, I just effed up. Well, Juliet walks away and she's making it up over the hill and he is looking kind of up at the screen and he goes, she knows. And Sims is like, what? She knows what? And he's just gone. Because right. it's like, and then he, he shouldn't have said it out loud. <laughs> he should not have said it out loud next to, I mean, Sims potentially is going to be his shadow. So maybe it'll be fine, but maybe not. You just don't know what's going to happen. That was what I want, had wanted to talk about with the casting. I'm sorry. I keep bouncing all over the place. We're all bouncing all over the place. I had said that I was on a Reddit thread earlier. The Reddit thread had mentioned when Tim Robbins yells, shut your eyes, that it is incredibly funny. <laughs> There's just something about the delivery of it. It's so ludicrous that that would even do anything. Coven is a phenomenal actor. And the other role that I know him for is an AMC TV show that used to air after The Walking Dead called Hell on Wheels. Hell on Wheels is historical fiction. It's loosely based on the great railroad race in the United States. Late 1800s? Yes. Okay. So the Civil War has just kind of wrapped up. The men from the Civil War have come back home. Some to their houses burned, their women killed, their children killed. Horrific stuff had happened. The segregation issue is going on because people are now free that have never been treated as even remotely human let alone the equal citizens at that time in the united states not only was there racial issues against blacks but also against the chinese and the irish the irish the chinese and blacks were predominantly the builders of the railroads obviously the racial issues with native indigenous people as well but anyway common is in it he's a freed slave who just wants to work his way up in the world He's like, I have the opportunity now. I want to. How do I do this? I don't think I ever finished it. Honestly, first two seasons are phenomenal. I believe there was a third that I never got around to, but it's a great show. I think it may have been canceled. I think it didn't do very well, but it right. was a really well done show. Well, compare the two roles. Is there something that he does here on Silo that he doesn't quite do on Helen? and I will Hell on give Wheels. him. He often is cast as like an angry man. It's just his thing. There's something about his delivery that feels like there's some deep anger like seething underneath an intensity to his it's anger. very intense yeah it's very intense so that was great for his role as a newly freed slave because dude you're gonna be super angry and everyone's trying to kick you back down it is about like working his way up not anybody else right he's like out for himself self-made right yes and in this show i would argue there is some of that too he does want to protect the silo, but really he's trying to further his career. For some reason. His wife says, we have but one ambition. Right. Good call. You even brought in some of our questions that we may I have. I thought that it was going to be about raising their son to be like the best that he could be. Right. No, it's not. Not if at anything, all. they're actually coddling him quite a bit for the ambition that they are clearly pursuing, which is that Sims would end up being the shadow for Bernard. Right, and that's the ambition for some the reason. most powerful person in the silo. Truly, you could argue that it's the mayor, but it's not. It's the janitor because he holds the keys, which is why having Bernard from IT become the mayor and then also be a part of janitorial mm -hmm. or that head of IT is a part of this weird black site <laughs> sort of surveillance situation. It's weird judicial. I don't know thing. if that was. And you know what? Let's ask this question, because. Is it even possible that Mayor Johns was in on this as well? Or was Bernard having to become the deputy mayor or the interim mayor? Just one of those things that A, lined up perfectly and B, he was already a part of this thing anyway. So it made sense to take control. Yeah, I think it made sense to him to take control. At first, it was like, I don't have anybody quite yet to pause it into this position. He didn't have anybody like on dumb hand. Dumb. Yeah, because... Well, which All is of a sudden, people are way. dropping like flies. And right. her death was not intentional. It, it was, was an accident. So I don't think there was any thought for like, who would I replace Johns with? There was no one to replace Johns. And I don't think Johns was in on it because Johns was reading through all of the diaries and ledgers kept by the previous mayors one by one to try right. to see if there had been a sheriff that had been tasked with cleaning at any time. Since the pact was put in place, because we know nothing of the time before that. From the founders. So let's go back to Common, because mm -hmm. I found that where his strong suit was, was, was his anger because his outward veneer was very calm, very mm -hmm. pleasant, but in a, in a way that's very ominous. Because, and not at first, 
because at first you're like this guy seems actually kind of like a nice guy everybody seems to be afraid of judicial and this but this guy's like trotting out all the charm he's not that the, bad of a guy but clearly you're meant to feel a certain way when johns and marns for example the first time you see him is when he gives the strawberry tart to johns mm-hmm. near the cornfields i think it was correct it, yeah they're yeah. they're taking the trip where they're going down all day so that she can secretly spend time with Marnes. that's really the reason mm-hmm. or Marnes could spend time with her i think it's really it's I, both they both way. they both said that that was why they agreed to do it right again sad but Ugh, going back to common it's this charm that you're wondering why everybody else is reacting a certain <laughs> like, way to yeah because she's like are you threatening me he offers her a strawberry tart which looks impeccable by the way for some reason and she's like why are you why are, is this a threat and you're like dude he's giving you a dessert how is this threatening right but there's something about his presence that is very intimidating oh without a doubt that presence changes when his tone changes mm-hmm. or at least it reveals its true colors <laughs> even Maybe. in that interaction because he says no takes the tart back you know after they have their little exchange And slowly eats the berries off of the top, like as he's staring at her, like walking backwards. It's horrifying. I would hate anyone to look at me like that. And yet at the same time, a little turned on. on. (laughs) He could hold you in his strong arms, you know. (laughs) And rub his bald head against my my little cheek right here with the little fuzz. Anyway, so. (laughs) Common, if you're listening, I don't really mean this. This is comedy. And uh, we do I'm not really you, doing it all that well. I'm sorry. There was just listening. some really interesting casting choices, and I really enjoyed all of them. Like George Ferdinand Kingsley, dude, so good. First of all, your name. Second of all, you're yeah, awesome. amazing. All of the casting throughout the entire series, even when we get into because you think you're going to have Holston a little bit longer, and then you don't, and then you're like, okay, now Juliet's going to take the place, but then also Marnes dies. And so then somebody has to be the deputy and then you get Billings and he's great too. And he's played by Chinaza Uche. Holston Becker is played by David Oyelowo. They're not actors that I knew prior to this series, but like I said, I know them now. Didn't AMC come out with a new series with David Oyelowo called? Um, Oh, he's been in some really cool stuff. He was in the number one ladies detective agency, which was on HBO. Based on a series of novels. So it is a mini series, but it's The Lawman Bass Reeves. Oh. On Paramount Plus, by the way. Yes, 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 yes. Because that's Taylor Sheridan. That's what I had a feeling about. In fact, it's not Lawman Bass Reeves, it's Lawmen Law Bass Reeves. Yeah. So they might bring in other Lawmen into this volume of series, let's say. It was highly celebrated, and I am curious of seeing it now. And that came out a year after Silo came out, probably end of 2023 so anyway great but why are all these british actors taking our jobs <laughs> <laughs> chinaze uche oh he played colby holman the actor's characters wes on fear the walking dead his brother Derek. yes he did That's he right. played Derek on yep. fear the walking dead you are correct yeah he kind of has played like several like small roles like he was in blue bloods one of his first roles just in an episode the blacklist for one episode Right. Fear the Walking Dead for one episode. He did some films and then he was in Silo. And then since then has been on Law and Order, but again, only for one episode. So, by the way, this is the actor who plays Paul Billings on this series. But one thing that you can say for certain for any role that you have seen, he has seen him in when we saw him as Derek on Fear the Walking Dead and also in this series for some reason. And maybe we can drill down on that reason. Possibly he's memorable. He just he holds is. your attention in a way that I can't completely verbalize. This is what I mean. Like, I cannot express enough how much I enjoyed the casting. I cannot fully verbalize why. It just was extremely well done. And a lot of these people caught your attention and held it. This is a good opportunity to transition into a feature that the show has that something like From and Lost does this a little well, but From doesn't do this quite as well. On the base layer of this series, what is the hook? The mystery. I love you. You said it. (laughs) Because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what is the answer he wants me to give? (laughs) No, that is the hook. Okay. I would argue it is also the hook for From. 
True. Oh, absolutely. But that is in a more, and when I was saying cerebral earlier, that's not really what I'm trying to encapsulate. Oh, I know, I know. I'm trying to encapsulate the mind screw that Stephen King offers, the mystery that you're never going to comprehend because it just is the way that it is, because that's the way that it's written. It's meant to mess with you psychologically. Silo is a true mystery. It's like you took a mystery novel and added sci fi to it. There's a death. How did he die? Why did he die? What was he hiding? It's really, truly at the base of it, a detective show. Yes, exactly. Okay, so I was going to get into that, but essentially that is it. But that is just the fertilizer. That is the base layer. That is the mm-hmm. foundation of the series. That is not what the series is really about. What the series does is maintain a base tone of mystery. It yep. flows throughout. It's the beat of the music. And it's always going to be there. But what the series tries to do across 10 episodes, first of all, in terms of photography and cinematography, it does a really great job of lining up the shots that you feel like you're actually on a different level. You're aware of your surroundings. And again, Mm -hmm. this is very important on a show where technically you're in a not a confined space. It's a towering apartment complex, let's say. Let's give recognition where it's due though yes the cinematography is great but a lot of that dave is set design this set design is phenomenal the down deep grimy looking they don't have as much stuff their housing units are smaller juliet sleeps in like a cubby in her first house right she helps the entire silo run and she (laughs) is sleeping in a hole in the wall but then as you get higher up the apartments are bigger there's more More spacious Almost needlessly spacious. They have nicer things. It still all looks aged because it is. That's the whole point. But well, it's built to last. So, but it looks nicer, cleaner, more tidy. Even as far as where the steps are, they look cleaner the further up you go. I mean, the, the main staircase. Yes. Yeah. yeah. True. Yes. What's interesting is yes, that is set design. But in some senses, the set design part of it is not as hard as you think. If you're reusing let's say the same apartment, but different configuration or different stuff on the walls. Mm -hmm. What makes that all great is the cinematography part of it. Because if you can believe that that's not the same room as this other person's room, then they've done it. They lined up the shots in such a way to make you believe that you're in a different place. That is where the film craft comes in. The setting up of certain shots to come up from the floor, like you're doing a base wipe where all the whole screen is black and all of a sudden the frame comes down and then you start seeing the characters and they're on separate sides of the screen. Or if it's coming from an angle that is making it feel like, okay, you have a lot more to go on those stairs or something to that effect makes you feel like, you know, where the characters are from different points of view, you know, where they're headed, you know, where they're going. Perfect. That was just me mentioning something on the side. All of that lends to what I'm about, about to say next. And that is you find yourself at certain points knowing that the mystery is there, but kind of forgetting about it because Then you start caring for the characters that, yes, a.k.a. for some reason right away you feel for when they do die in the beginning. And then Mm -hmm. later on, the characters that are left behind become much more rich and complex along the way to the point where you're more involved in the actual characters' struggles, wondering when they're off screen how they're doing. Because sometimes the characters mentioned off screen and you don't see them like Juliet for a significant amount of time. And you're wondering where she is. She's being mentioned all over the place, but you don't know where she is. Mm -hmm. Things like that, where you start forgetting about the mystery and start focusing more on the character wanting to win or this character wanting to lose. It becomes a character focused series with this base tone again of this mystery. But you forget about the mystery and all of a sudden it comes back by the end. I don't know that I forget about it. I'm not saying that you forget about it completely, but I'm saying is. You came in for the mystery, but you walked away with this hero's journey, let's say. That makes sense, actually. And multiple heroes passed the torch to make this journey happen. That's why I feel like there's a disconnect there for me. I loved the show, but the reason I kept watching it was because I had to know what was happening. The entire script is well written for the entirety of the first season. Everything is extremely believable. The dialogue sounds natural, even when they're talking about things that are a true juxtaposition to what we know in our society now. Not knowing what a camera is, not knowing what a video is, not is knowing baffling what stars to me. Are. Not knowing how to swim at all, being terrified of water because what you reason could just would drown you have to know how to swim? Yeah. There are no swimming pools. There's no swimming. 
don't think there's even tubs, right? No, Maybe? that would be a huge waste of water. Which is some of the signs that are on the wall, too, by the mm-hmm. way warning people not to waste water i'm heavily driven by the mystery that is truly the hook that is the base the character development is just icing on the cake i would say but because they do such abrupt shifts to the characters that you're focused on because they do it's very abrupt suddenly you're at this point in the story you're like wait what happened (laughs) two years what's going on where are we back here So I'll say they did do that near the beginning and occasionally at the end. Mm -hmm. But I feel like they took a break from that somewhere in the middle. Well, and somewhere in the middle, again, this Reddit thread that I was in said one through three mystery. Hey, and it rhymes too. four through seven. Heaven. (laughs) NYPD silo. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So hold on a second. Then it is doing this thing where I've heard somebody talk about this when it comes to film craft is incorporating genres. So you do have the detective genre that comes heavily, in heavily right? and then it, and then it suddenly swaps out for a different genre. Let's say the mystery is always at the bottom. The sci fi mysteries. What is the silo? Why are these people this way? That's always going to be there. Why this show works, I think, is because this is palatable to anyone, even if you're not a science fiction fan. Right. Because it doesn't go hard enough on the sci fi bent. Not at all. At all. Not at all. If it wasn't dystopian, I don't know that I would have loved it as much as I did. But that's just like a person as like a personal preference. I really love dystopian stuff. But sci fi wise, it doesn't really scratch that itch necessarily, which is fine. It's the same reason why people suddenly found themselves liking The Walking Dead after not really watching horror per se. Mm -hmm. They just said, oh, you should really watch it. It's not that bad. I mean, it is a little gross, but here and there. But it's about the characters in Correct. a sense. It's a drama that has a foundational layer of this horror element that mm-hmm. this can happen at any time. Yeah. It's the same thing here. There is a sci-fi element, but you don't have to be a sci-fi fan. I, and I think that's a mark of a good television show where you can bring in an audience that wouldn't otherwise watch it. I think so. And I have to say, we've mentioned the casting numerous times, and now we've mentioned Walking Dead numerous times, and we have yet to mention the connection between the two, which is that Avi Nash is in this. We mentioned Tanase Uche from Fear of the Walking Dead. We didn't remember. We didn't mention. And I'll tell you why we didn't mention him. And I hope we do see him again. I think we will. I think he's going to be a big part of the second season. That's my hope, anyway. That little Walking Dead bias came in when it came to his character when he first comes on it's great you're like oh it's Javi Nash oh yeah. sexy mother effort and then <laughs> what happens to him later on in the series his character is treated rather I would go as far to say Avi Nash is treated a little bit ingloriously <laughs> well you got this actor who comes in and he's oh he's kind of like George but not really and maybe that's intentional that's fine and my bias is throwing me off I think he's meant to remind you a little bit of George, the same level of charm. Exactly. It's like a charisma. It's not charisma like when people have charisma and they know they have charisma. It's like a shy guy charisma. Yeah, not like like George. Yeah, (laughs) not like George. He's meant to be likable. He's meant to be inquisitive in a way that leads you to think, oh, okay, cool. He wants to know the same things that we want to know. Right. He's the us. Except... He doesn't want to know the same things that we want to know if it means dying. Right, right. So he wants like, to know no. within the boundaries of being able to know. <laughs> I track the lights in the sky uh, just because I'm analytical. I don't want to know what they are. He's like that mixture of both things because when he's talking to Bernard, because Bernard's trying to call him out saying, you're yes. curious. I was like, well, I'm not curious, but analytical. Bernard is describing a thing to him that he didn't know about himself, I think. Yes, Bernard is describing him as curious, saying the thing out loud that Lucas Kyle, that he doesn't know about himself or that he doesn't have the words to describe, that he thought maybe curious meant one thing, a.k.a. you get thrown in the mines. For 10 years. <laughs> but no, it's such a fundamental, natural part of us that to have it is almost like breathing for humans. Well, that's why this whole concept of like the silo is truly running everything, including who is born. You'd have to. Because humans are naturally inquisitive. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a bunch of dummies out there. So if you wanted to just pile up a bunch of dummies in a silo, I'm sure you could. But eventually people will, It's you know, life finds a way, right? <laughs> Thanks, Jurassic Park. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, um, Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> people aren't willing to swallow the lies that we're fed all of the time 
forever. People get so heated over politics. It's the same thing. It's because there are people in power above you who are telling you what to think and what to believe. And that goes against our very nature as humans. It's not the inquisitive nature necessarily. It's the lying down and taking it. And maybe that's like a truly American way to look at this. Because it's like a very American mentality. Well, I'm approaching it more from like a biological evolutionary perspective because there are two competing interests. One is more individualistic, innate in us, the desire to achieve more, to know more in order to achieve more. And there's other competing imperative, which is be a part of the team. Don't go out of line. There's strength in numbers. Tribe up Mm -hmm. to maintain stronger numbers. Tribe up because... Otherwise, people will want to kill you, that sort of thing. And that's true. So these are the two competing interests. And we deal with this every day. We deal with situations where what is more important on our Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Is it truth Mm. or is it not security per se? Order over truth. Truth is what's written on the badge. Truth is a young man's game, though. It's revealed in the back of the badge. It says truth. I could just because we're watching it again. I could just hear your voice in my head. You get it? You get it? <laughs> Do you it's get Bridget. it? Do you get it's it Bridget. yet? <laughs> yeah, because we really like to hammer stuff home for the, for the dummies. <laughs> truth versus stability, essentially. I had a question for you about this, though, since we started this rewatch, because you said that you watched the last episode and it cleared up something for you. So what was it? Okay, so here's what it was. <laughs> let's, okay. let's call Dave out for being a big dumb dumb. Because well, I just I'm curious because I'm like, did I miss it and did I still not see it this time around? That so was this my is the big that dumb, dumb moment. The show doesn't really make it terribly clear that this is how Juliet was able to survive outside oh, the silo. It's the heat tape, Dave. It is, and again, this is one of those details. Oh, it was in, mentioned in the first episode, and here it is again. But it has a bigger purpose, mm-hmm. and yet it had its purpose throughout each of the episodes. But anyway, I didn't know that it was a heat tape. I was a big dum-dum and I must have missed a detail when Martha visits Carla, supply, Mm. heat tape, because I was so focused on the badge part of it for some reason, (laughs) which when she trips over. See, when I first watched it, I thought she was tripping because, oh, that's what everybody did, which is what everybody else in the cafeteria saw. Oh, she's falling because she's... They think she's succumbing to the poison in the air or whatever. So I sort of thought that too. At the time, the first watch, not my notes watch. Okay. But it's really her tripping over Holston's foot. Correct. Let's say. Because he she can't see it. She has the display is a lie. Mm-hmm. Her display is a lie. Yeah. And you have to kind of re- keep remembering that her display is a lie. You have to keep writing it in your dumb notes. So the first time around, I thought, oh, she's succumbing. She, uh, no, but she placed the badge on the boundary and that allowed her to pass. Big dumb dumb. Oh. I thought there was like some sort of uh, distortion field or some sci-fi thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get... No, that... I mean, I could see... I could see landing there. I was watching the first time around. I think I rewound it to a certain point to try to see what I might have missed. Like, how did Mm -hmm. you do that? Yeah. (laughs) This time around with the notes, I was like, there's no way I'm missing it. I'm spending some more time on this episode. To be fair, they do not come out and say it. Right. They don't say it. It is very implied. They show it so many times they don't explicitly say it out loud they no. don't go and maybe to your to your to this maybe tickles your fancy they don't go do you get it do you get well, it i mean i appreciated that because i did get it the first time but oh uh, a rose on your nose <laughs> <laughs> so i'm sorry name i did no it's but, it's me being a dum-dum it's fine we can all be dum-dums but i enjoy that sometimes when they don't come out and say it because it's like we're not always stupid There are stupid people in the world. Do not get me wrong, but not everyone's one of them. Now, that being said, this is a good part that I like to focus on a good point. And that is, it's not the if you didn't get it the first time you failed at telling the story. Mm -hmm. This is one of those things where when I finished watching it and didn't get it, it made me want to watch at least that episode again to try and get it. Because maybe there was something in the the way things were revealed that I didn't miss. And that is true. Mm hmm. So I don't blame the show for that because you know how some people will be like, oh, it just didn't land for me. Didn't feel this episode. That's not what this was. I I had my mind blown situation, too. You get the reveal. You still get the reveal either way. But You do want to know how it was done. So that's okay. Well, because I am left with questions based on that scene. Not just the city of ruin in the background, not just the many, many silos that we don't know what's going on with that. It's the is Juliet's air tank thing gonna last is it filled with oxygen or is it like a respirator two 
was the faulty heat tape intentional to kill them? I think that's what the she knows is about. Not she knows that the her own display is a lie. I don't think that's it. I think the she knows is she know she knew about the heat tape. Now, I don't know that she did know about the heat tape. I think just by chance this worked out the way that it did. It's because Walker figured out the heat tape. Right. Which exactly. now, I think so that's now it. there are people in the silo. So we're left with Lucas knowing more of, of the truth. Sims knows more of the truth now and will maybe continue to learn more. Walker now knows more of the truth. So does the sheriff Hank in the down deep. Billing knows so much of the truth that he is nearly incapable of moving away from it. Right. It's unavoidable, especially after viewing the contents of the Georgia Tour Company book. I wanted to say it like I that. Loved so the, I loved that out. it was a book about Georgia. I was like, I love this. But where was this filmed? <laughs> <laughs> There's an argument to be made here that everybody has, just like the show, that has a base layer of mystery. Mm -hmm. A thick base layer, too, by the way. I'm not saying that it was a thin one, but what did they say about this particular cleaning? They said it garnered more people watching. More it than attendance even than any Holston. other. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you could say even if you hadn't watched the cleaning, everybody else knows what exactly happened. And that is seeing the, the silhouette of Juliet go over that ridge. That's a true. She that refused know the about. cleaning and she was the first person, as far as we know, to refuse the cleaning. Correct. Because I think that's the intention of the false display in my mind. Yeah. The intention of the false clean. display is for people to get outside, even though they've sworn that they will never. Just like that one guy who said, you'll have to put a gun to my head in order to get me to clean one of Holston's arrests in previous right. years. They go out, they see the false display and then they clean in hopes that you'll be able to see it because Whatever the name of the video is, Jean Jane Carmody. She's talking like, can anybody hear me? Here's what I love about this. And I don't know that it's so, super noticeable on the first watch, Dave. It was noticeable on the second. So I'll give anyone this if they miss this. The birds are the same. Yes, but it's even better than that. The video that they watch on the hard drive, the birds are seen flying to the right. But in the view screen... People are watching the birds fly to the left, which mm -hmm. shows you that you're not exactly sure if this is real or if this is fake because of the different directions. It mirror it basically mirrors the view screen. That's how Juliet was able to put together that Holston was at her feet. It's before Holston's at her feet. It's when she does it clean. She sees the birds. They fly across. It flashes back to the video right. of her watching it. And she puts it together in that moment. This is not real. The display is a lie. And she says it. The display is a lie. That's why she goes over, drops the steel wool. That's where the name of the book wool comes from, is the wool that they're given to clean. Now, going to the actual cleaning part, though. Yes. Because I didn't want to move away from that point just yet. I like this idea because what the people on the inside are effectively using as a window, watching this single camera uh. as their window to the outside, is actually real. It is not fake. It is showing you the way the I world know. is currently. I know. Which is great because all the while you're thinking to yourself as a person who lives in this world, oh, it can't be like that. They're hiding it from us. They're not telling mm -hmm. us because you're a cynical piece of crap. And that's how you think of everything. Oh, the government's lying to us. <laughs> Rich people are awful. Well, all these things. Make it a lot so, easier, Dave, if it was that way, you know? Right. So when the truth is revealed that, yes, that's actually how the world is. And the whole mm -hmm. reason for the display being a lie is a double edged sword. If you're a terrible person who's murdered somebody and you're sent to outside to clean and you say, I'll never clean, put a gun to my head. I'm never going to clean. And they end up cleaning because they want you to be jealous of him or her. I'm outside. You're stuck in here. Mm. La 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 la. And then I'm dead. And if you're a good person, you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'll clean because everybody needs to know. Everybody I don't know that know. it's that, Dave. I think this just tears out any barriers because if you step out those doors and that's what you see on your monitor, your entire life has been a lie and everyone's life has been a lie. And that transcends like the good or bad. Well, I'm just saying it's, it's the two possible extremes. You look at you're playing the part of me. Oh, people are good inside. Inherently. No, they're not. They're horrible. <laughs> but truly, I'm going the other way. I'm thinking like, OK, here's the two possible extremes. A good person want people to know a bad person be like, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> but here's why though just to clean the screen yep that's it yep that's it that's all that that's all that's there for that's like it's literally really, to clean really, it's not really, a euphemism really really really, really want to know what happened before the rebellion how was it before i'm thinking it was bad actually i don't know i don't know i'm 
I'm very curious because it's like for all of these rules to exist, what was happening before? That is actually very curious because I have a, a developing theory. I think the advent of pre-silo artifacts and knowledge and all that stuff might have been pre-rebellion. Gloria says the silo erased us, put something in the water, some memories would fade. Mm. Erase the past and anyone who tried to preserve it. So I think what happened, maybe pre-silo, picture this in your mind. The time between people going into the silo and the rebellion is about 40 years. That's two generations. Mm -hmm. That's enough generations for the first generation to actually know something, the second generation to be past that knowing something to somebody else. Then the rebellion happens. And then all of a sudden, relics are outlawed. Some are pre-rebellion and some are pre-silo. All mm -hmm. of them are registered after the rebellion. Correct. So what I'm thinking is post-rebellion was a renaissance, I guess, in the way they treated the silo. First of all, they had to figure out a way to make people forget. Second of all, they had to control breeding. And third mm -hmm. of all, they had to make it so that people stopped asking questions about what life was like on the surface or facts that might get mm -hmm. them to want to know about those things or things from before well, it's almost like i wonder were they piping in that other image before did they want people to have a happy window to look out of oh do you know what i mean that's interesting if you all know the real reason why you're there the world is absolute chaos above wouldn't it be nicer to have a window of the way that you rem want to remember the world instead of the way that it actually is but in order to control them, if you're going to change everything so that you can keep a more docile public, then you put what's really out there to be like, nope, you need to know you have it so much better in here. And then that would mean that that camera was installed post rebellion. Potentially. Not at the start of the silo. Or maybe it was just to kind of monitor the situation to see if anything mm -hmm. worse happened. Well, I mean, you want to be able to see if all of a sudden there's like green grass out there. But see, here's the thing that kills me you want to be able to see. But you don't want to be able to see too much. Well, that's why they're all like in a crater. Right. One POV, right? Let's just say, because we don't really know that no. all the silos have that camera near the door of the bunker. Well, it looks to be that that is the case because they all have the little shell. True. And the door to the outside is more of like a flat. It's, and it's further in front storm of Storm door. Yeah. yeah. They're all in craters. In like this, this little crater ridge situation, yeah. right? Where they I'm can't just really saying see. Like, so they can't see each other. Okay. So. They Every cannot silo. see each other. That's intentional. And so that's the thing. It makes the people in the silo feel like they're the last people on earth. And yet all Correct. these silos feel like they're the last. They're all next to each other. They don't know each other's existence. But my thought is if you're trying to sequester them to say like, you're safe here and you don't need to go out and we're keeping a docile public, you don't want them to know that there are other people out there because that creates inquisition in your mind. Then you're like who are these other people? Where, where are they? What are they like? Do they speak the same languages that we do? Do they sound the same? Do they look the same? Is there DNA in the water to suggest that maybe there are people elsewhere that because then there's no magnification. Mm -hmm. You can't find the trace elements. You can't find elements of different organisms and people that you can't catalog DNA. Maybe there is no DNA database anymore. The deeper down the magnifying level that you go, you start figuring out how things work. Mm-hmm like molecules, mil minerals, then you wonder, oh, can we replicate that? Then you wonder, what if we got samples from the surface? And that you can't do. Then you start wondering, can we find a way to live on the surface? No, no, you're not meant to. Yeah. I just wonder what it was like pre-rebellion because I wonder if it was more the memory of what was out there and that's what caused the rebellion is like, right. if you lock people up for so many years, they're going to go crazy. Right. And I think that the syndrome to some degree stems from that we're not meant to live underground without so I sunlight i think it's some sort of like there's some sort of link there to that so that could be like a vitamin d deficiency i think we'll learn more about it in this next season because i believe billings will be our main character moving yeah forward. and maybe we'll switch back and forth between her him and i think we'll switch Juliet. between billings i think they'll withhold Juliet for a while actually i think we're gonna switch between lucas and we're gonna find out more about the mine because we we know like next to nothing about the mining true we, we haven't seen the mine for nothing right no. we, we saw, saw scavenging but we didn't see mine we saw the farming level we've seen like not even below the silo next to the silo well i think it was below the silo but it's like this chasm it's next to it though right. like based on the map what they were saying was that it looks like this was meant to be where another silo was supposed to be put 
but they s- decided not to dig any further because of the water. And then they pour 30 feet 30 of concrete, feet or of concrete yeah. to prevent the foundation from buckling or something like mm-hmm. that and, and abandon it, basically. Before we move on, I think there's a point of the conversation where we're, we're going to have a lot of back and forth. And I think it's the one where you're going to find me the most annoying. Usually I'm going to take the other side of the argument. I okay. always do because it's the core of my being. It's true. And that is the constant push and pull of what is more important, truth or mm. stability. Mm. And this is crafted this way. Your gut instinct is to say the truth. It's what we put on a pedestal above all things is that the truth is the most important. To lie is not only to sin, but like to truly wrong the people around you. And there's an argument to even say that without actual truth, there can be no real stability in this life, at least that we're living now outside in the real world. Not Being the person that I am and trying to put myself in the situation of these people. Like Bernard and I would maybe think stability was more important. And they have an argument. I think stability would be more important. Or inarguably. I think what the series excels at, as much as all throughout you're thinking, she's got to find the truth. She's got to find the truth. She's got to find the truth. Well, because when the truth is all greenery and happiness, that should be shared. Theoretically. I think that's why I feel like stability is more important. she doesn't see that until near the end. She doesn't see the Jane Carmody kid. That's the whole point. But from her point of view, the truth meant all these deaths. What happened here? Well, it Why meant, did my boyfriend have to die? It meant finding out what happened to George. That's truly right. what it meant for her. And that Which, was all again, she cared about. Touches on, on the human element that distracts you from the mystery. And they did that, I think, very well. Even throwing in a wrench of, well, George didn't love me for a couple of episodes. And coming back to it and him proclaiming his love along the way. He didn't tell her about having a wife. So there's that posthumously that's the weird (laughs) thing posthumously bringing this character back on a couple of occasions Mm -hmm. and getting to make him out to be a more complex character than the faux charming full of himself one note that he appeared to be at first Mm -hmm. again you care about him long after he's gone and then there are a couple wrinkles that get added throughout the way even after he's gone that's like when juliet walks over the ridge And you find out that Holston and Allison Becker are actually dead is devastating because in your mind, the whole time you're holding out hope that everything is a lie and they didn't actually die. And the display is showing their dead bodies, even though they made it past. But there's a two year discrepancy in which Allison said, Allison leaves, she walks and she says, I'll come back for you if I'm right. Two years pass throughout your watch you're thinking which is real did she which actually make it over yeah. right again first watches are so so important mm-hmm. because it frames how you see the series just because you watch it again like oh, i knew that no you didn't no you didn't. not at the time <laughs> at the time you're like which is real yeah yeah you are wondering the whole time which is real what is the truth but that's the great part about it, is you're along for the ride with the characters not knowing what is the truth and craving finding it out, which is why right. like as humans, we prioritize truth for ourselves. It does not mean that we will prioritize telling the truth. I want to be very clear about that. <laughs> right. Which is a total we are liars by nature. <laughs> Just horrible. Well, we're but, narcissists by nature. <laughs> yeah, we don't well, want people to think ill of us. Exactly. We so, need to maintain that image we have so of ourselves. We'll lie in order to yeah. maintain the image. And sometimes we'll lie to others, too, to maintain their image. It could be altruistic. But anyway, let's close the book on this truth versus stability conversation, because I will argue that the show at least shifts it slightly in the direction of stability. Oh, yeah. Well, you know me. I would be vehemently pro-truth. Oh, yeah. Me, too. That's me to the core. Yeah. It's my thing. No, no, but truth is my thing. No, I don't own it, but I will put it above all else. And then the show got me to think at least... Do they have an argument as much as I dislike these characters because they're lying to me and other Mm -hmm. 10,000 other people? Are they right? Because they're keeping everybody safe. Yeah. Do they have an argument even if they don't have? And then it makes me when I watched it again, it makes me actually see them in a more sympathetic way, even though Tim Robbins's performance is a little goofy. Mm -hmm. And even though Common is a bit angry in places that take that where he takes it personally, obviously, because Juliet was in his house and then it got him to actually think of his own individual needs and wanting to protect his personal family rather Mm -hmm. than the residents of the silo all this to say that you can even get people to hesitate 
and take that position. And I think most audiences that watch the show that actually are good people, because <laughs> I can see a world in which, no, truth, bro, truth, bro, over everything. I don't care if 10,000 people die. I think some people may stand vehemently behind that still. I can't discredit them. I mean, of course, the truth is, it's extremely important. I can, and I'll tell you why, because this is something that Sharon D put a finger on when we were talking about the season two finale of House of the Dragon. And that is the pandemic gave us a taste of what it was like to live in scarcity or in fear. Mm -hmm. And since we were coming out of that, when Silo first came out, we watched it shortly thereafter. If you can't put yourself in the mindset of placing order, stability over truth, you didn't get the memo. I'm not saying that the show didn't put us in the mindset of these people, the people in charge, the people living in the silo. I'm not saying it did, it did do that. I did feel it. In some places, I felt claustrophobic. In some places, I felt what Juliet was feeling when she saw the overwhelming amount of water from a great height. Mm. I mm -hmm. felt that. And to her, it was even more than that because she's never seen, first of all, so much space in one visual cortex. And then all this water. And what if I drowned in that water? And then she had to go into the... Mm. the reservoir tank where the spillover happens or the steam vent is that was i felt for her because nobody was, was really ever serious. in that much amount of water anyway all of this to say is that the show did a good job of putting us in the mindset of shifting us slightly and if you didn't feel that and you're still pro-truth or ever and you didn't hesitate in saying pro-truth for every single episode you didn't get the memo you didn't learn anything because you're supposed to somewhat feel that's what that i meant dave when i said the truth is a young man's game like, I didn't know that's what you meant. Yeah, that's what I meant. Again, dumb, dumb. <laughs> that's what I meant. I wanted to talk about the water because George says a really interesting bit of information in his final farewell right. to Juliet. And he says, the water, as it turns out, isn't a problem. What does he that mean? He figured out the problem. He figured out the problem. Is it a hologram? <laughs> Dave, that's weird. Did he find a way to breathe? Is the water there, but do you swim through it very shortly and then all of a sudden is there like a little underground tunnel and then you're like up or yeah or is it more shallow than it actually is or yeah yeah i don't know i don't i don't know but I, that you want to know my you want to know how much that of a drove dum -dum me crazy that was one of the things that drove me you crazy know how much of a dum-dum i am hmm. there's a switch on the wall where you just pull it down and the water recedes oh like in mario 64 exactly yeah, mario sure. 64 <laughs> or or the you know Legend the of Zelda or something. One. one of the three D uh, Zelda yeah, Mario yeah, yeah, games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pirate, the pirate exactly. ship you level. Put, and you 64. put a statue on a block, and the water goes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's fair. That's one of the questions I had at the end. Well, there's That's... another question, but we'll we'll get to that. The door itself. Where does it lead? The next where does it lead? Over. Where does the other door lead that Tim Robbins goes into? Okay, so that is the server room. It actually has the name server room above yes, the door. But what's now, actually back there, Dave? What is the significance? I'm not even going to say, oh, there's a mystery there. No, it's a server room. And that why is, is the key room. red? Why is it flashing red? What's okay, going so on that, there? that I can actually tell you half the answer to. Okay. 18 corresponds with the serial number of a hard drive that was sure. plugged into the system. Is it Once the it number of the, the system, silo? It vibrating. But what is with the, the deal with that same charm, that mm -hmm. flashing charm when the drive is plugged in? What is the deal with it having an actual key in, within it? The key opens a server room, probably also labeled 18. Yeah, exactly. Is 18 the number of the silo? Oh, well, it's more of an answer because you're answering a possible question, <laughs> <laughs> not a question. <laughs> I'm willing to accept that. that I that don't know. Hard it's just 18 is... is frequently mentioned. So I'm like, how much more frequently than the one? Or oh, well, the hard drive and the, the charm. hard drive is 18. Well, and obviously then... it's linked to the charm, but yeah. Yes. No other relic was linked to a two digit number. True. And even the hard drive itself had a serial number, which I wrote down. I think 18 was just written down. On, with, it's like carved into it yeah, like someone did it with like right. a key it's not even the actual serial number which starts with like atr it's yeah. it's not even that important no. but i'll say this the only thing that i might be willing to say is that bernard goes to the server room to turn off the display in juliet's See, monitor i That's wondered the if only that was thing it. i could think of that was i wondered if that was it okay here's the reason because it goes back to my insistence that you need to be moved to take Bernard's position of stability. You need to feel for these characters because they're not inherently evil. Yes, they're willing to kill people in order to keep 10,000 other people alive. 
So when he yeah. goes to the server room, in my mind, I'm thinking he's going there to disconnect the display in her visor so that she can now become the explorer for the sake of all. I thought if maybe she could that was figure the case. something out. But is it just that she crossed the ridge? I was thinking that as well, but I was trying to think of reasons why he goes to the server room in the first place. Because the display is know. obviously linked to the video that Jane Carmody sees in mm -hmm. her view screen when she's out cleaning. Yeah. And who knows the level of technology that was achieved by the people in the before times, too. There are references to years, I think. Most of it is how many years passed mm -hmm. the silo or past yeah. the rebellion on Freedom yeah, Day. Yeah, because like the files are from like year 97. Year 97 silo, of the silo. Year 97 or whatever. Exactly. None of it is in our year system, Gregorian calendar yeah. system. It's the only thing I could think of at the time. And it makes more sense when you are conscious of the fact that stability at least has to be considered. Because if he's turning it off to see if she could become the explorer, he's doing it because it's in the silo's best interest or the residents of the silo mm -hmm. for her to actually figure something out so that when she comes back, if she comes back, she can maybe save humanity. Mm, okay. That has to be in the forefront of somebody who is protecting both the residents clandestinely and then also in the actuality. All right. It has I'll to be in that. their mind. But again, they may flip the script and it'll be a sinister <laughs> I don't, reason. I don't and, know. I don't and know. Bernard is always evil and that's all he'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> but also hilarious. Okay. So here's what I wanted to go back to. Allison. Because I struggled with the first episode of this show. The first time. The second time, really? the third okay. time, the fourth time. <laughs> this is a story that unfortunately a lot of women are familiar with. The trying for a baby, the waiting. The year. <sighs> the trying and the waiting and the, the having sex and it not working out and the back and forth. And I'm going to get emotional because I've gone through this. But <laughs> the thoughts in the back of your mind, well, me being like a conspiracy theorist or at least enjoying a conspiracy theory, I enjoy them. I like to collect them as fun they're things. My little, they're my little pets. And some people will be like, Bridget, you don't actually believe that. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. My husband's like, you don't believe in Bigfoot. I'm like, arguably I do. And he's like, no, you just say that because you think it's funny when you say that to other people. And I'm like, no, I would like Bigfoot to be real because I like for there to be mystery in the world still. That's really where it comes Yeah, you're, you're like a Joe Rogan conspiracy theorist where... Yeah, I yeah. like to talk about them. I don't know that I necessarily believe in all of them, but... Or I do believe in them, but I don't, I don't have enough emotional or intellectual investment <laughs> to really... Truly. Like, what's I'm not for like, dinner? I'm not like <laughs> having what's his name from Blink-182 level delusions that i've right. got to share with the world that aliens are real and they've spoken to me do you and know you're what I mean? an idiot if you don't think that that's i real. don't remember his name but it was one of the guys from like 182 and that was a really sad story <laughs> I, don't, anyway. I don't know what you're talking about but anyway an image of like my, my mind. Uh, anyway you're not invested in your conspiracy theories i'm not at like Just, dan Aykroyd level i do know what you mean and i almost feel like he too but in his own way is just entertaining his conspiracy theories rather than investing. Maybe. But you too are experiencing a version of truth over stability because you believe certain things, but you prefer your own mental and physical yeah. stability over them. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Micro sure. silo. Sure. When I tell you that that first episode emotionally is so draining for me for so many reasons. One, Allison's like, I'm not the problem. I found the problem. And it requires that you see the truth, which you're never going to believe. And everyone's like, it's okay, honey. It's so hard to try for a year and not have anything happen. And she's like, I'm not crazy. I'm showing you the evidence. I'm it's not right crazy. Here. I'm telling you I'm not crazy. I understand that this is an emotional thing that I've been going through. And yes, it like breaks your mind and your heart to go through that. <sighs> Dave, I feel like easily any woman who has been through like any sort of fertility struggle has been in that exact position. And when I tell you, I wish that I could say with 100% certainty that the government was stopping me from having a baby. This is the reason. If I could take the pressure- Off of yourself. Off of myself and put it somewhere else. I totally would. As crazy as that sounds. Because that sounds insane. Either this has been going on forever and just no one talks about it, or it's worse than it ever has been before. I don't know. Probably bank on the ladder, but... And that leads me to kind of go down that rabbit hole of like, is there something in the water? Is there, because you know what I mean? Because this is making like, you so it, insane that wouldn't it be a relief if it wasn't my 
quote unquote fault because it exactly. really isn't your it really isn't your fault exactly but, there, but you're putting a lot of pressure <laughs> on yourself to succeed but it's amplified by the fact that growing up we're told and i don't know if this is still happening in, in sex ed education but it was happening when you and i were kids all it takes is one time oh all yeah. it takes is one time dave right D right really is that true is that it's not true. It takes one time in the perfect conditions. <laughs> it takes one time at the exact right moment. You know what? My mom, you were full of it because you lied and told me that if I ever had sex, it would happen. And right. two, education system, it, another child left behind in terms of this, okay? Because <laughs> well, it's not true. It's not let, true. Let me just put it to you this way, though. There is... A sliding scale of truth to that and now i completely and totally understand why in middle east and asian countries and maybe even europe at a point there were marriages at 13 or arranged marriages at 13 oh yeah well because the older you get wanna, the harder you're, you're less fertile right and, and you're more excited and it does still require a specific pinpoint moment in a cycle there's so many jokes i can make but okay. i'm not going to i just <laughs> about it's fine the, you can add the levity ferocity, to this moment the ferocity of the egg and the ferocity you could add levity to this moment sperm, it's okay but it's like gonna... it's like a it's like it has to happen at that right time because the sperm can only live for five days max even in sex ed they tell you that they the that out of yes billions then, and billions of sperm they're also only one they're makes... also telling you the whole time but don't do it because if you do you're gonna have lifelong ramifications and they're a child and so you're like, oh, OK, well, I can't have sex because obviously if I do, I will have a kid. Right. It's sort of the same reason why the silo does not take any chances by showing pre silo artifacts or even pre, pre rebellion mm. artifacts. It's why it doesn't take chances with magnification, because that shred or that trace, kind of like what George says, down to the minutia, even if it's it doesn't even sound like it, like the Pez dispenser yeah. ultimately doesn't matter. Yeah. But the mere presence of it makes you want to build a society around that monument to figure out what happened. And that spreads and that thought spreads and curiosity spreads. And all of a sudden, your 10,000 people are whittled down to two. And that's the struggle. One of the reasons I really bring this up is because Bernard says to Juliet before she walks, you were not supposed to happen. Right. And accidents do happen because her mother wasn't was the kind of person they didn't want having children. And yet it happened anyway. And yet it happened anyway. Even through the contraceptive. Yeah. <laughs> Scormatic sex ed. Yeah. Yeah. Because that does happen. It's that's it why does. they give you percentage I rates. I worked, I worked with a girl who got pregnant on an IUD. It happens. Right. Does right, happen. Right. Life will uh, find a way. Well, find a but way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Jeff. Except when the government is trying to stop you from having a child. <laughs> See? Ends on a high note. To some... <laughs> To some degree, I would like to live with that delusion. I know that it's not true. I don't wish I had psychosis, but maybe just in this one specific instance. Because from that psychosis, creative things might happen. As a result, I could change my diet and all of a sudden be... Things like that, where yeah. I could try to do medicines. Anything to get you by is probably just okay. Just stop drinking the water. You know <laughs> just, what I mean? But all uh, of this to kind of go back to your original first feelings, when you were witnessing this tragedy unfold. Did it make you reject Silo in a way, or did, did it endear you to Allison and her struggle and the struggles of other mothers throughout the series? It just made it hard to watch. So the same thing has happened to me to a number of shows. I think as infertility has become more of a topic for people, to some degree is it happening more frequently now? Maybe because people are waiting longer to have children. Correlation isn't causation, but right. that it is could definitely be multiple factors, yeah, but that is one of them. That's sure. Part of it. It's become a topic in a lot of shows and including shows that like are normally comedies and stuff. And honestly, for a lot of shows, it's made me stop watching them. Like if we get to that episode and that becomes a thing, I'm like, dude, I can't do this. I'm like crying now at a at a sitcom. What is even happening? That's not OK. I've been given a piece of advice it was given by someone who teaches about minimalism. If you are seeing other people and their life, for whatever reason, leaves you feeling wanting, then just don't follow them anymore. 
social media has really like set the bar for like what life is supposed to look like for us. That and the fact that our parents were much further along in their lives than any of us are. I'm, and this is coming from like a specifically millennial mindset right now. So sorry, anybody younger than us. We grew up with parents who were in their 20s, who had a house, who had their careers for the most part. So us hitting those 20s and then skating right on past them into your 30s and still not even feeling remotely equipped to have any of that stuff, to feel like a real adult. I think all of us are kind of left with that feeling. I think our parents felt that too. It's just that they didn't tell us. Or they had it in different ways. Because that how do you we tell your kids, I don't know what I'm doing? This is the first time I've done this. And then you realize that all generations are like that. Right. As much knowledge as there is out there in the world and traditions that people follow. But it's just that people didn't used to talk about their feelings as much. And social media wasn't around for people to just yammer on the internet like we are right now for people to listen to for whatever reason. Well, and that knowledge is accrued over so many generations across time that even with all of that and you're sitting in front of a baby, let's just say that. Yeah. It all goes away because all of that knowledge builds up so that when you face that baby, you can have some modicum of like, okay, this is terrifying, but I'll get through it. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. You're still terrified. Well, you have to get through it because there's a tiny human relying on you. Right. Now. Right. And it's so there's a part of you that kicks you into anymore. survival. Yeah. It's survival is your survival and all that stuff. Yeah. But all, the, all of this to say... Every generation, at the very least, has this one problem, and that is no matter how much knowledge there is out there, no matter what's been passed down, no matter what they say you should do versus that generation, what they said you should do, Mm -hmm. everybody is a first-time parent. Well, yeah, of course. Everything is new under the sun, and yet nothing is new under the sun, and yet it still is terrifying. Yeah. No matter what they tell you. And you're reminded of that in the show, honestly, even without the knowledge and stuff, because everything is gone from the before, that young woman comes in to see Juliet's dad. And she's crying because she slept an hour later and couldn't hear her baby crying. And right. she's like, I'm a horrible mother. And it's like, no, your baby is fine. You're tired. And, and you that's in. okay, too, because you're a human. And like, that's and it. your baby oh, okay. still survived. Anyway, in other television shows, I've stopped watching them because our world is constantly pumping imagery at us with the intention that we spend that we want, that we are out there wanting bigger, better things for ourselves. It's all, I would argue, a giant pyramid scheme in order to get you to buy more things. It's my belief. <laughs> I told you I like conspiracy theories. So They're anyway. all trying to lead you to a conclusion, right? Yes. So don't follow the people who leave you wanting. So I try to apply that to a lot of my life. I hate to say this, but a lot of the time when people become pregnant very suddenly and they're like, I didn't even try. As, as soon as those words are uttered out of your mouth, you're gone from my feed because I can't handle it. I'm allowed to choose that. And I shouldn't feel yeah. guilty about that. That was also something I struggled with for a long time. It's, it's, about feeling there's two guilty. ends of that spectrum. Yeah. One you're covering, the other one you still have to work on though. <laughs> like you have to be in the world and know that this exists. But well, at the same I know time, that it exists, but I don't have to intentionally subject myself to it. Right. Put myself in the position where I'm constantly bombarded by that. Yeah. Yes. No, because of, yes, course, of course my friends get pregnant around me and like that's You're hard not gonna too. cut them out of your life. Right. No, that's hard too. If they're truly a friend, I can have a real conversation with them where I'm like, maybe not comfortable going to your baby shower. And that's a thing. And I've skipped out on several because I just can't, can't do it. It's like, yes, I want to be there for you, but no. This really affects me in a way that you I can't. cannot be for there for yeah. you in this way at this moment. Right. So I'll anyway. still send your baby a gift. That's fine. Exactly. Whatever. And I'll love your baby with my whole heart. Right. But just your, can't. your baby will grow up to be an annoying human <laughs> and we'll get past this moment. <laughs> just can't do it. You know what I mean? Just can't, just do, can't it. do it right now. Just while can't it's do still it right now. Yeah, exactly. Fresh out the oven. So <laughs> when shows come on and there are stuff like this that I like really can relate to. Sometimes I just shut it off and I say, you don't have to do this to yourself. So what made you keep it on in this scenario? I don't know, Dave. I cannot think back to that moment. Now, here's the thing. Infertility grief is the same as any other type of grief. It comes in waves. Some days I'm completely fine. And in the back of my head, I'm like, maybe you wouldn't be able to do it anyway. Maybe you wouldn't be good at it. You know, whatever. And I like am able to move on. It's the same thing with my dad. You know, my dad passed in 2019. It's been almost five years it'll be five years this year and every once in a while like i will just get hit with a wave of grief and it'll be something stupid like 
Hootie and the Blowfish comes on the radio. And <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's so dumb. It's so dumb. I, I realized that crying at Hootie and the Blowfish is very stupid. It's the first concert my dad ever took me to. I was in fifth grade. That was a band that we both liked. Something about listening to it just brings my dad right back. Trav and I have been watching through the Star Trek series. We watched Next Generation. And I was fine until like one episode. All of a sudden, I just start bawling. And Travis is like, until you get to inner light, he's like, "Are you so okay?" And I'm it's like, "All over." <laughs> and I'm like, "This just reminds me a lot of my dad." Jean Luc was like his favorite person. He loved Patrick Stewart. He loved the show. So when I watch it, it was fun at first, and then all of a sudden, it just like hit like a ton of bricks. I can't remember if maybe at this time I was like, "This sucks." But I was so intrigued by the mystery, I was able to look past it. Or if I was kind of on one of those downswings. Or upswings? I guess it would be an upswing. upswing yeah, yeah, it's an upswing. Well, could it also be like what you said before? Could it be the fact that there was a conspiracy theory there? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe you like, like oh, this me? bitch is my hero. <laughs> uh, well, I remember thinking, because you have to understand, Dave, on top of everything else that I am going through currently, I was unconscious for several weeks of my life. Right. And don't know what happened. And nobody ever did an MRI on my brain. They did an MRI on my heart. Probably have some form of brain damage. Most likely. Or alien probe. Maybe. Uh, uh. And here's the thing, Dave. I have an X-shaped scar right here on my forehead, and I have no clue where it came from. So you tell me. It's one of those things where, like, I noticed it, like, maybe a couple years ago after, after the heart thing. And I asked Travis, I was like, where is this scar from? And he's like, I don't know. What right, because you were on the couch when you passed out or whatever, yeah. right? It's not like it's, I fell or anything. No, anything. And, yeah. no, and there was nothing. The only scar that I have is on my thigh. And it's from the line that they ran up into my right. heart. Yeah. See, this is the part where things. you put the X-Files theme. <laughs> but then we'll get some I sort am of Mulder. copyright. I am Mulder in this situation. So that's, No, but that's, that's like right after you said, I have an X-Scar on my forehead. I, <laughs> okay, so like... So sometimes if I think about it too much, I get a little bit freaked out. It's all about control, right? That's all humans ever want is control. And we never have it. Even the delusion of control that we have as humans being cognizant of what's going on around you, that's taken away from you. And you are in right. the hands of complete and utter strangers. Well, and the, and the mysteries of the silo. <laughs> well, just anyway. So I'm left AKA thinking. Universe. I was out for two weeks and I was told by several doctors. To never have children after that. Did they implant a little something to stop it from happening? You know what I mean? So they siloed you. Maybe. Basically, they're saying, we don't Maybe. want bitches like this to have kids. Maybe. Or here's the bigger conspiracy that is terrifying. And I hate it when TV shows do this episode. But here you go. Did I die? Or am I in a coma? And I never woke up. And none of this is real. I will one day share with you. <laughs> I do have a theory of how, because it, it does involve multiverse and living forever oh god I can't, I can't even tell you but that day is not today this does cross <laughs> my mind like maybe i'm actually dead and nothing that's happening right now is real it's just the synapses in my brain firing and this is coming from someone who believes in an afterlife stuff gets dark up here but this again two competing evolutionary principles knowing or f having a tradition where there an afterlife exists because who doesn't want to live forever, quote unquote, or have this presence that there, you'll go on after you're dead. But then there's another competing principle where I want to actually live forever. <laughs> so I it's mean, like not in the afterlife, in this life, because yeah, as much as you don't like this life, there's that thing inside you that says, come on, bitch, the live. drive, the drive. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Self-preservation in the real world. Yeah. Not in the fairy world. It's I real. Mean, I don't know. Yeah, no, it is real. Even if you believe in an afterlife, that's still there. Yeah, that drive that's exactly. That's all I'm saying yeah. is there, there are two competing principles that often work well together. Yeah. Extremely well. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes they don't. Anyway, I just think that that storyline hits on a real nerve. Maybe that happened for other people. I just want other people to know you're not alone in that. And if that made you shut it off, I don't blame you. I'm still going to call them pansy asses. How dare you, Dave? I, I had the spirit of Sharon to me. No, I, I don't believe that. It's, <laughs> it's... <laughs> Audience, you're terrible all the time. <laughs> no, I don't really believe that. I, there is a part of me that always thinks this is not targeted at you, but when the audience feels like that, that something is too much for them, I, there is a part of me that feels like, come on, let's get past it. Look, look oh, at the boys. Yeah, season, no, I look know. at the boys season four. 
Eh, get past it. Get past <sighs> this. Get past that. <laughs> oh, there's some. That is the hell. I like that. Barf. Barf. <laughs> barf. barf. Just big old barf. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, hey, it wasn't that bad, actually. Just you have to get past a lot of Ugh. bramble, let's just call it. You had your machete. You cut out the bad parts. You embrace the good parts. It's not for like five minutes of good parts. <laughs> anyway, Sometimes, moving on. I didn't needs. like. I didn't like the boys. Season four. I think that's the recap saying. on this is that even though this was tough for you to watch, that's the thing. It's that good that even though that hurt me on such a deep level, I still wanted to continue to watch it because I was so desperate to have more answers. Yeah, exactly. And it's in service of this overall mystery that is this tremendous bass tone that travels throughout oh. each and every episode. Sometimes you hear it less in one episode. Sometimes you hear it more in another episode, but it all seems to work, which is kind of the keynote of what you're trying to say is even though it hurt you mm -hmm. to watch this in this character, she's obviously suffering. She's putting on a brave face. Holston was the person she was worried that would have not the brave face. Correct. Initially. Yeah. And yet her troubles evolved into this whole other concern because of the new information that she had from George. Mm -hmm. That maybe I'm not going back to your conspiracy. That maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe I'm not the problem in this scenario. And that touched you in a way that tickled, first of all, your truth finding thing, but it also tickled your, I want this to not be me or my problem or that I'm the obstacle here. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah. I And I think... Although they both end up dead, which is super heartbreaking. And I wish that wasn't the case. There is beauty in knowing that Holston took off the helmet and in his last moments on Earth reached for his wife, who he now knew was dead. Was not crazy. And was not crazy. Not crazy. Knew she was dead and knew she was not crazy. Because he yeah. had to lift off the helmet to see her foot. Yeah. As we now know. Well, he took it off because it's green. So you assume everything's maybe fine. But then also, my wife is here on the camera inside. I need Where to is confirm. she now? Yeah. Right. The interesting thing about this story is that it relies on generations upon generations to adhere to the rules, which is extremely difficult. And so... Mm you start to understand that there is a reasoning behind the silo, not to hash that again, but that that tradition has to pass down from each generation to each generation. What I liked about the actual mystery is that it changes hands from each person that it touches. They basically eradicated all the flame keepers of which Gloria was a part of. Hannah was a lateral movement attempt at maintaining the flame keepers mm -hmm. and that got snuffed out too mm -hmm. hannah nichols this was juliet's mom but it lived on in another survivor of the flame keepers which was george and was his mom george took on that charge had the georgia tourism book kept the flame alive flame keepers right mm -hmm. and it touched allison touched holston becker and then found its way back around to juliet somehow yes hers isn't a search for the truth it's honoring the people around her I don't know that she really cared about finding the truth as right. much as she cared about George not dying for no reason and Holston telling her, you have to find the truth because essentially you're the only person left who can. But there's an irony to what all of this, and that's what, exactly what Bernard says, you weren't supposed to be born, it, probably for exactly the biological reasons why mm -hmm. they don't want these people to have kids. And so the fact that she was around to be able to light that spark and keep the flame going again after it had been snuffed out. And now has lit it in everyone. maybe hundreds of people because she refused to claim. I wouldn't say hundreds. I'd say the whole silo. They're going to have to really tamp some stuff down if they're going to try to keep it they're, going. They're going to have to really increase whatever they're putting in the water again. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And so that is yet another thing that should not be overlooked as another question that's left over from the side. Like, what happens to all the residents? Because one of the big questions we had was, where is Juliet going? There are silos next to each other. What is in the server room other than maybe servers? How or long what is your suit What did last? he do when he got there? The biggest question of all, because yes, you love your protagonists. Yes, you love the people you learn to care about. Mm -hmm. But the, let's just say the womb of this entire series is the safety of its residents in the silo. Yeah. And so... If we're to be human beings for a moment and not just people watching a television show, that is a big thing. The fact that they saw this happen 
puts everything everybody ever followed diligently and sometimes with fear, sometimes without not think, most times without not thinking, Mm -hmm. throws everybody into question. Listen, I'm inclined to say that I think the overwhelming majority, which is why your instinct was hundreds of people, the overwhelming majority will probably move on with their day. I think so. But it lit enough of a spark. I could see like Cheryl being one of the people looking for answers moving forward or Cooper because he was Juliet's shadow. And I'm sure right. he's going to be very or impacted maybe not. by her death. Maybe he doesn't have time for that now. I really want to see Lucas again. I don't know if it'll be like Juliet and we just won't see him right away. And it will heavily follow Billings for a while. Billings and Sims, I think, will really be the firm front of the show moving forward. See, Lucas, I'm not too convinced of because there's a mechanism has been deployed on him and that is a tremendous amount of fear because it's one thing if you go down to town to the mines for 10 years mm-hmm. it's another if your mother does too or has to go out and clean so i would be inclined to think that we may see him and there may, may be something in the mines but i don't think he's a player there are many reasons why the people that we see and learn to care about on this show for a variety of reasons or not even care about but are invested in mm-hmm. have to not acknowledge what they saw on the screens and mm-hmm. have to move on and that's going to be the tension. Yeah. The people that we wouldn't expect. Like you, your gut said, oh, Avi Nash has to be a big player in this. I series. want him no. to be. I want him I to know. be. I know. It's your bias, right? Because I know I'm feeling what you're feeling. I want Hank to be too. But that's because I really like Hank. I think he is because he scooped Juliet out of the scavenger. Well, he at very bottom. least is going to be questioned by ju- judicial. Maybe stripped of his title. He was helping to harbor a fugitive. But that was smoothed over by Juliet going out to clean hopefully because they they give the down deep a ton of passes i don't know if you watch the series well they have but the to. down deep gets away with saying a lot of things that would get you in jail they have to, to clean. because if they if they say you're gonna get you they'll just stop working and then the silo will end right really, exactly truly and at the same time, they still have to discriminate against them, knock them in the heads. A it's couple interesting, time, though, because again. that's the trade off is they have more freedom. And we talk about details that have to be not overlooked. There is a thing that Martha says about the down deep. Shirley tells Martha that Juliet said she wanted to go out to clean. Mm-hmm. Shirley also said Knox said they would punish us for the rebellion. Now, I took that to mean that mechanical is the remnants of the rebellion, like the children that were left over and that generation continued that specific phrasing could mean a variety of things maybe but i i I can't think of any other real tangible explanations but i feel like mechanical i guess i kind of assumed that it was in reference to like if we rebelled now standing up for juliet exactly exactly. we'll be crushed that rebellion would be crushed but i wonder though like what did happen to them did they kill all the kids wouldn't it be cool if season two was about the before Right, they do a backtrack yeah, into I how this that. came about. But you know what? See, I can see why they wouldn't do that because there is know. a inmatious rest element that makes it so that it might be better not to know so that you could fill in the blanks as we go or mm-hmm. maybe some things, like Bernard says, just another mystery of the silo and that it's left to your own interpretation. Yeah. So I could go either way on that. Listen, my body wants to know. But my brain is like, but maybe it's better not to know and you can figure it out. My mind's telling me no, but <laughs> my, my body is <laughs> telling me go, go, go. <laughs> By the way, you take for granted that Juliet has never seen the Jane Carmody cleaning until the second to last episode or third I to know, last episode. I know. Or the end of the third to last episode. I know. Because you think, oh, it's everybody's revealed seen to it. us so early on. It feels like a small detail at the time, but remember when they turned off the power in, I think, is a third episode? It's the third. And then all of a sudden the view screen turns to the nice looking one. Mm-hmm. And you know, people saw the birds outside for yep. a hot, tiny half, not even a half quarter a second before they lived in terror for eight hours. And it's the same thing now is the beginning of the third episode, I think, and then the end of the seventh episode. There's also, they're playing with some symmetry here too within each episode. People are doing the same things over and over again, but it's different players. Mm -hmm. This is actually what I wanted to say about the beauty in watching these characters hand off the baton to the other character. Like Allison hands it off to Holston, Holston hands it off to Marnes, Marnes hands it off to Johns, Johns hands it off to Juliet, literally by Mm -hmm. making her sheriff. In her own way, Juliet hands out multiple batons to Billings, even Bernard and even Sims in in their their own respective ways. Yes, because Bernard's left thinking, what's this door that she's talking about? Exactly. And Sims (laughs) Sims is left thinking, now he's got the doubt in his mind. 
about I saw the screen. This guy's going, he's wishy-washy with me about this ambition that I have. Am I going to get it or not? And he's not telling me everything because he's just dipping out. And why is this ambition so important? Is it just because of ambition or is it because of something else? Like he has a design. Yeah. Are they flame keepers? Playing the long game? Yeah. But one of the things Juliet does give him is the ability to place his family over the needs of the silo, which is something that he would never do on an ordinary day. Mm -hmm. And Martha has all the batons. And for some reason, doesn't get punished because maybe there's a bigger thing to her than we realize. See, that's another thing that is wonderful, because let me ask you a question. Did you assume like maybe a million other people, except for that one person that said told you so for some reason, because they're big assholes. And that that guy is usually me for the entire duration of the series until you get to the last episode. Did you think Carla, Martha's wife or girlfriend was dead? Oh, no, I didn't think she was dead. Why? I, I assumed she was dead and that's why she was agoraphobic and not leaving oh, the apartment. No, her whole conversation with John's made me think that they just separated. Oh, I thought she was dead. Dead oh, as a doornail. No. Okay. Because she okay. says you were really good together. But the way that she delivered that line made me think. It just fell so apart. So you should have stayed together. I don't know. Something about so then it. Why did they see that's that's another mystery. Why did they separate? I don't okay. know. I'm glad I brought this up because a the oh i thought she was dead the entire time she turns out she lives so wait what's the deal with that what made her go so far away from her was it to keep her safe was it so that's an, that's a know. mystery that's left behind i don't know there's was more it because to martha of the than thing appears. with juliet I, don't, I mean i don't know i don't know what happened there see you know? had we had we ended this recap with just that we would have missed out on that one nugget she's bigger than she appears to be there's more to her than we know Oh, That's all yeah. I'm say. Hands down, because yeah. she's friends with the mayor and you don't even know until the mayor comes all the way down there. Yep. D-A-F-U-Q, as they say. By the way, I just want to say one little nugget. When one of the raiders comes back down with the sheriff's office stuff and Common's just going through it, does this look like a hard drive? Does this look like a hard drive? He throws a stapler across the screen, across the room. Mm hmm. One of the things that happens is the stapler b- bounces so hard off the wall that it c- that half of it comes back and almost lands on his face. Oh my it's God. so close. It bounces on the desk. He hit it so hard. So he hit it on the wall across the room, bounces back, hits his desk. And I thought to myself, this guy is so good. He did not flinch. And mm. they kept that take in. He's a tough guy. Which is just like a little tag on what you said about Common, how he plays anger really well. But in it, especially in this series when he I think plays he, his charm so well. I think it so could well. come from like an earnest place. He could tap into things that he's been through in, in life. I think it makes him a great actor. I think often when we find out more about the great actors in the world, there's more there emotionally. Like any artist, right? They usually have some sort of depth of tragedy or trauma in their lives to pull from and that's why they create the beauty that they can i hope that's true otherwise he's like well i just read this book and and i learned to not flinch from a buddhist monk let me just end on the reunification of pete and juliet juliet's father again first watch brain keep that first watch brain on throughout this you're meant to feel like pete's a boob he's Ooh, one of those com- he might people. be one of the people who keeps the flame alive afterwards in the future in right the future. yeah sure yeah sure because she tries to tell him i didn't ask to go out because she didn't Initially. and that is one of the cruelest things that i've ever seen play out is the lie that they built to get her out of there but she At can't least when she's say in the holding it. cell she can't yeah, say exactly it because she's being watched but i wonder if he'll think back on that and realize that she was trying to say i didn't I'm doing this for all of you basically yeah well and after seeing her go over that ridge that again changes everything it changes p yeah. and it will probably tap into common's anger <laughs> so just <laughs> to see how that goes but i did like that little bit about knowing that the cameras existed and were surveilling the whole time and mm. knowing that they were able to reconcile before not just before she she went to go she he, he in the midst of all the chaos she said it's not your fault i i know the truth now it wasn't you yeah. i know it wasn't you yeah. even though you know see well parallel Okay, because Allison thought she was crazy, probably Mm -hmm. at one point. It's me. It's got to be me. Pete, too, probably at some point thought it was him. And how could it be me? Was I careless? Did I do something wrong? No, no, I didn't do something wrong. And yet my daughter hates me and wants nothing to do with me so far to go all the way down to the bottom floor to be as far away from me as possible. Mm -hmm. And to have that reconnection, that's something that I think everybody got a little bit out out of because 
one of my biggest nightmares was, I don't know if it still is, telling people that I didn't do something and having the world not believe me. It's the most frightening thing I could think of because that exists. It's in the most terrible of stories. The, the Boston witch hunts, uh, not the Boston Tea the Party. The Salem witch trials. The Salem witch hunts, I thank think, you. I think about that a lot when you hear people like claiming that they didn't murder somebody or whatever, deny it to their very last breath. And I think, what if that's the truth and we're not seeing everything somehow? And what if that was me? Yeah. And so symmetry. I think lastly, I'll say, I I don't think we're done seeing many of the characters that have long since passed. No, I I think we may see many of them surprise us coming back. I'm hoping to see what you said before is possible backtracked into the rebellion and how that will play out. I would love that. For some reason, this reminded me of another show and I can't remember what it was. You had the same thought I had. It was a show on Netflix and it was canceled. The show is called Ascension and essentially it's a simulation. These people are in a rocket ship, quote unquote. It's a generational journey across time. You have multiple generations living on this rocket ship and there's a murder that happens that calls into question their existence. Is there like a beach area? Yes, in the rocket ship. Yes. Yes. There's like sand and water and they have to swim down to the bottom because there's like something is in the trap there. And it's the dead body. Evidence. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't remember what it was, but I was like, I watched something. It was very 1950s. Was very like Fallout ish. Yeah. Fallout adjacent. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) But inside rather than outside. Ascension. You're right. (laughs) It was in 2014. It was a sci-fi series that made it to Netflix. One one year. Yeah. 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 And Trisha Helfer was in it, and I love her because she won 90s icon for modeling but Battlestar Galactica but also Battlestar Galactica yeah (laughs) I was going to mention that at the top of the show because it has a similar premise it's a multi-generational let's say dystopian but it isn't dystopian it's simulation well it is because aren't they looking for a new place to live because earth was destroyed it's all a lie you find out as you watch in ascension that Uh. the world outside the ship has been moving on and the person that That's murdered right. them was one of the engineers or whatever, IT or something, from the outside murdering somebody on the inside of the ship. From the inside of the ship, they That's see right. all the stars and their That's right, because it's all showing fake. The journey. It's all fake and it's like in a missile silo or whatever and it's like a exactly. studio. And what's real interesting about that is that you have Truman the perspective Chippo. from both sides. Yes. Too. And they're shutting down the program and what well, do you do with all these people? they can't bring them out because they wouldn't be able to assimilate. Well, yeah. And how do you tell generations upon generations of people? Because this program went on for decades upon decades. Yeah. Anyway, watch Ascension. It's really fascinating. I'm really sad that it didn't go beyond first season. Truly. Maybe this will bring it back. No, 10. It's 10 years later, by the way. It's 2014 is when this came out. (laughs) This but this podcast alone will bring it back. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Bring back Ascension in our silo recap. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right, folks. I think. There's only so much you can do in a recap episode. I think we asked some of the big questions that were left off from the first season. We've added enough flavor of the thing you already watched. So it's really hard to do recaps for us. We like to dig deeper. However, we weren't there when these episodes came out week to week. And you watched the series. You got something out of it, too. So tell us what you got out of it. What was the part that you liked the most? What are the things that you liked so much about this series? What tickled you that we didn't mention? Or you can tag on to what we have mentioned. Just tell us anything either in the YouTube comments or at ratethispodcast.com slash squawking dead. And if you really, really want to tickle our fancy, you can head on over to our Kofi and Patreon pages and just follow us for free so that you can join us in our upcoming recording sessions discussing the second season week by week. Following us is free. Attending the recording sessions is free. We just don't post them on social media. So the only way to do that is to follow our Kofi and Patreon pages. If you like what we're doing here, and you're going to really like what we're going to do for Silo, consider joining a membership tier for as little as $4 a month. When you do, you'll get the unedited version of this discussion and all future and past discussions. Join our Discord so that you can know when we're about to record. And if you happen to join the Whispers, Survivors, and Great M tier, which is our new producer tier, you will be able to get 50% off in our merch store, a free classic t-shirt upon signing up, And if you happen to join the upper tiers, you'll be able to join us on camera and mic to discuss these episodes alongside us. 
For more information on that, head on over to ko-fi.com slash guacidead or patreon.com slash guacidead. And in the meantime, I've been your host, David Cameo, and I was joined by Bridget, ko-fi.com slash punkybrews. It's P-U-N-K-Y-B-R-U-S-E-T-E-R. And I can't wait to talk about season two. It can Me neither. can go anywhere from here, and I'll still love it. Love it with all my heart two years later. I'm ready. I don't think I'm ready, but I'm going to make myself ready. And I hope you do too. I told you I'd rather kill myself than choose between any of these shows. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited for this show more than any other show that we're covering right now. I like From. I'm excited for From. The first episode of the second season of Daryl Dixon is bomb. So. Yeah. But you know what? There's something to be said. Of, it's like when Connie appeared on the show and there was a little thing between her and Daryl Dixon. There's something to be said about something new. Mm-hmm. From doesn't feel new to me. It's new enough. But I kind of like Silo more. There's something to it. It was digestible. The momentum was moving. It didn't leave you wanting the way From has in many, many spots. It's intentional. I know. But you mm-hmm. know what? Sometimes it's nice to get something. No, well, that's fair. And keep the party moving. Anyway, that's it, folks. We'll see you next time. Join us for our upcoming recording sessions as we cover the first season of From. The following week, we will we'll be covering the second season of From. And all of this is outlined on a post that you can check out for free containing our calendar and upcoming immediate recording sessions on Kofi and Patreon. Until then, remember that we are squawking dead. I don't have any quip. I don't have a quip. Dan Aykroyd would have a quip. I'm sorry. I'm disappointed. Dan Aykroyd. Like... <laughs> I think his middle name is Quip. quip. Daniel Quip, quip Aykroyd. Aykroyd. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's the podcast. DQA. Thank you so much for listening to our first foray into discussing Apple TV's Silo, where we recapped the first season. I'm hoping you enjoyed it as much as Bridget and I did. And now we've reached the point where we give a shout out to our upper tier members, our Great M and Whispers tier members. Starting with the Great M tier, we have at Real Ryan GM on both X and Instagram. Moving on to the Whispers tier members, we've got Aiden Atkin, who you can reach at ko com slash Aiden Atkin at Kim.Rowley, the number one, at Sandy.D.Morrison and at Lois.Martin.54 on Facebook. And on Instagram, we've got at Judith.Morton. We're waiting with bated breath for season two of Silo, where we'll be breaking the episodes week by week alongside you as you watch, trying to make our predictions, enjoying the mystery, revealing it slowly. Check out both our Kofi and Patreon pages for our upcoming recording schedules, where we're going to be recapping from season one one week, from season two the next week, and jumping right into the first episode of season three. And the week after that, The Walking Dead Daryl Dixon's second season, Book of Carol. It's season premiere. In any case, take care, everybody. You've got a busy season ahead. Hang on. It's going to be a bumpy ride, but we'll get through it and we'll enjoy it all along the way. And in the meantime, remember again that we are squawking dead.